why we are here today all together. It all started with this headline from a European newspaper. The vice president of the European Investment Bank also say that projects which are likely to result in more CO2 emissions will not be offered financial support. Immediately after reading this article, I had this feeling that what we expect from our European institutions is not to continue to suffocate us. Knowing the race for change that is happening everywhere, it is possible that this threat, the threat might not work so well. Why? Hearing about crypto economy, maybe there will be another way to finance projects in the future. And this headline also reminded me of the digital transformation program, which we conducted almost 10 years ago. At the time, we had this attitude of people are not stupid, the social ne networks, it's just a fad, it will not last. And we know today how social media create influencers in our world, dictate who we should be voting for and spread a truth at a speed never observed. And what we are doing in our institutions, we are trying to catch up with the crazy train and the fierce gaffa. And then there's also the story of collaboration, which is a recurring motto in our European institutions. But then again, it seems more and more than when we have the opportunity to show how well we work together, it seems like our stakeholders and ultimate customers, the citizens, don't seem to share our enthusiasm, as we could read in the European EU barometer this morning. So as we like to say in Together Ensemble, no one is ever to blame, and we don't like to sound critical, especially because these are not times for this. It's time for more actions. If there is one thing that is certain for our future, it is that in 70 years, we will no longer be Together Ensemble. What we want with this number 39 session is to make our future selves work hard to question truly our views on this world and what is needed as a response. We will have more impact in today's context if we choose to be a force for bigger dreams, imagination, innovation, a bigger force for good. And if we have the duty to protect people and the planet, we also have the duty to reposition ourselves to make sure our agenda leads to successful outcomes. We need to better understand what's going on, the ideas on the table, and have these conversations that are not happening anywhere else. We need to think about the new approach to drive change, whether or not universal basic income is the social pillar we need for the Green Deal. If crypto economy is an opportunity and if the new normal will effectively be the new reality. The role we will play in this new normal is so key. We want to ask you this question right now before we start the conversation with Roiz. How do you feel about the future? Uncertain, anxious, excited. Julie, what do you think? It represents, uh, I think, uh, very well the variety of feelings that uh, we observe at the moment during this. I mean, during this crisis and um, and 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 with the climate change, of course, uh, perspective. So, uh, but maybe Roy, if you want to say a few words. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for inviting me to the session. And I would say that this is very typical of the spread of views uh, across society with uncertain inevitably being the most common uh, characteristic of how we view the future because so much has changed so quickly in the last 15 months. And there's so much about which we don't have real information or a real sense of direction in, in the years ahead. So uncertain is, is probably the most positive and the right place to be. Uh, I would worry about the people who are overly confident about what the future is like, going to look like, or those who have overly defeated that future. We need that uncertainty because it drives our curiosity, it drives our willingness to learn, 
and that drives our ability to acquire the capabilities to navigate whatever might come next. So on, on, on after that and with that introduction, maybe we can uh, we can begin our conversation with you, Rohit, about the different. Well, actually, we had a, a long list of things that we wanted to talk to you about. So um, uh, we we uh, we can perhaps begin by saying that well, we're we've been through or we're still in the middle of perhaps this pandemic, uh, and the world has kind of changed radically. Um, and there was a book that um, that uh, you and your your colleagues which had uh, written about aftershocks and opportunities. So um, what um, what we were sort of wondering is that having looked into the future, then what do you see in terms of not only the future of work but also the future of society in general? How will our lives look like from now onwards? One of the big challenges. Uh, when trying to think about the future is we all do it from our own context. So whether we're in uh, an organization like the EU, whether we're in a national government, whether we're in a business or in a family, we tend to view it through the lens of what we're doing now, how we're organized today, the processes we have. And so there's often a dissonance between what might be coming or changing and how we're set up to deal with it. And so one of the things we have to do is to step outside and put ourselves, for example, in the shoes of the citizen. And if you're a citizen today, you're seeing a number of conflicting developments. You're seeing the pandemic and you're hearing the story that this virus will be with us for a long time and we may have to be vaccinated on a regular basis. And we just don't know how that's going to impact things like the shape of the economy. We're not sure whether economies are going to come back to where they were in 2019. We're hearing and starting to see the impact of new technologies, particularly artificial intelligence, robotic process automation that are taking away jobs. We're beginning to hear the rumors from the big technology companies saying, between us and national governments, we're putting hundreds of billions of euros into technology development to create smarter and smarter systems. And maybe sometime between 2023 and 2025, we'll reach the peak of organizational employment. We'll, by then, we'll have built systems that automate many of the roles we do in even the most advanced technology organizations. And then we're seeing all of the environmental challenges. We're seeing uncertainty around whether political and governance systems and cope with the speed of change. And then we're seeing huge economic fragility. And then this crazy community emerging from the crypto community who are way more excited about the future and about how you democratize everything, how you democratize finance, how you create inclusion. So there's a huge conflict for anyone doing a 360 view. And our challenge as an institution is to start to really make sure we're standing in their shoes, thinking about their needs, and then bringing that back and saying, okay, how do we work with those challenges? How do we organize internally to deal with what we see coming, which may not be exactly the way we're organized today? You, you mentioned this community of uh, very enthusiastic people, excited about the future. Uh, can you tell us a bit more? I mean, do, we, do they have plans, for instance, uh, against our institutions? Would they like to do without us? It's not that they want to do without the institutions. They just want the institutions to innovate and work in, in far more citizen-focused manners uh, and, and faster and to make best use of the technology. And I'm not saying that's right or wrong, but take, take an organization like Cardano. Uh, they're a crypto venture running on a blockchain, and their whole premise is about banking the unbankable and empowering citizens around the world. So they, they have partnerships in Africa to give every citizen a digital identity that then allows them to access financial systems. And whether you have... 10 cents or one euro or a thousand euros to be able to do something with that financially that enhances your prospects. They want governance systems to be very different. One of the things you see in that community is when a new venture starts, uh, typically the founders of that, that venture 
was set up a channel in a social media platform called Telegram. And every week, every fortnight, every month, they'll have a conversation with their whole community, telling them about what they're developing. The community have bought effectively shares through buying tokens. The community has a say. In many cases, the community votes on what the platform will do and, and what features they want. That's a very different way of organizing. And what they're saying is the kind of models they're establishing could be used for governance. They could, of, of nations, of uh, transnational organizations. They're a way of giving people a voice. And for them, what's really important is it's trustless, i.e. everything is recorded on the blockchain. You don't know who's done it, but you can see everything that happens and you can't change anything. So what they're saying is it's completely transparent you don't have to worry about trusting anyone. You can see everything. The, the, the downside is many of these organizations have no employees. They build the platform and then they, they kind of step back. The community runs it and they're called decentralized autonomous organizations. So there's a challenge there around employment. But the benefit is you, we have previously unimaginable models for doing things. So take simple things like finance. If you put your money in the bank, the bank might give you, if you're lucky, 1% interest. The bank then lends that money to other people who lend it on. The bank takes interest from them and the bank makes a lot of money but gives you a fraction of it. It spends some of the money it earns on the infrastructure, on its people, on profits. In the new decentralized world of finance in, in the blockchain, I can put my money into uh, a particular token and they can, share, set, they can lend that to other people. The money they get from lending it, they distribute amongst the people who own the tokens. And every time someone buys a token, a fraction of it is shared amongst everyone. So what that means is I can earn half a percent interest a day on my money there. Now, that is crazy if I went to a bank and said that. Give me half a percent interest a day, i.e. nearly 200 percent interest a year because I'm compounding it. But this is happening because people are bringing a wholly different model. They're not making the money up. In most cases, they're setting up uh, these tokens or currencies with a very fixed supply, which means it's not inflationary. Whereas national currencies, we can print more and more and more, which is inflationary. These are deflationary. And so they've got a very different model there in everything, in governance, in the economy, in the business models in the way that the community involved participates. And so that can be taken to any sector. It can be taken to business. It can be taken the way you run communities. It can be taken to the way you run your local hospital uh, and, and the way you run your government. And they're very excited about what they're creating. And what they really want is, is the rest of the world to kind of wake up and say, how do we do some of this stuff? Not how do we find ways not to do it? I mean, uh, this is a very kind of wonderful picture with, with uh, cryptocurrency and blockchain uh, that you're, you're presenting. But for example, last week, I think the Biden administration has announced that in its budget, then it'll be uh, an, uh, applying some taxation or they, 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 they want to be, they, they seem to be quite fearful. Of, um, of this and what you're uh, saying would be embraced by people in general, administrations, and I don't think it's just the Biden administration, I think uh, other governments as well find themselves perhaps challenged uh, by, by that. Should, should they, should we be worried by blockchain and cryptocurrency? I think we should be worried about how slow governments are moving. It's cryptocurrencies have been around, for, crypto assets have been around for that. It's just taken a long time for government to catch up. And we need to tax. You know, we can't allow a, a kind of segment of society to be operating in that world and not paying tax. But that's about learning how to do it. And that's about going back to that community and saying that you're setting up these incredible new models, which we don't even understand. Tell us how we tax. How do we tax in this world? How do we make sure we're not missing anything? At the moment, there's a few issues. Uh, governments are deliberately putting out some, some messages to slow down people's participation in the crypto economy until they catch up. Uh, if you want to see the real signals, look at who's been put in charge of the Security and Exchange Commission in the US. 
It's a guy called Gary Gensler. Where does he come from? He was the leading authority on blockchain and cryptocurrency at MIT. And has previously worked, I think, for the Treasury, uh, was an advisor under Obama. So he's not a crazy left fielder, but they're trying to bring someone in who understands what they're trying to deal with. And then they're trying to find the right mechanisms. It will be slow. China is building its own digital currency. Many others are. And you've got this schizophrenic approach around the world where some countries are encouraging it and saying to people, come and build your crypto ventures in our country. And others are saying, no, we won't do it. Uh, and then other, the population are working out that if I have something that's stable, uh, then it's much better than being in a currency that's inflating by a thousand percent. Uh, and that my currency, therefore, is being, you know, an economy that's inflating by a thousand percent. And therefore, the, 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 the note I have in my hand is worth one thousand percent less tomorrow. People are beginning to understand that if they use these things, they can have more stability. So inevitably, with something that is this young, there are lots of teething issues. There's a lot of conversation about the energy usage. Well, the energy usage is less than is used for gold mining, and no one complains about that. It's less than we use for air conditioning. And it's a fraction of the amount of total energy that's wasted in the world. Uh, so you know that energy is produced it's already creating a carbon footprint. Uh, over half of it is done with renewable energy. So we have to get beyond the fear, uncertainty, doubt, the noise, and really start to understand these things with a view to how do I make them work for my citizenry or our citizenry? And then what is the right regulatory framework to put around them to protect everyone, but get the maximum benefit? And the way you deal with this kind of truly disruptive innovation is not to simply try and find ways of stopping it and slowing it down. It's about partnering with the people who are creating the disruption to say, how do we govern it? In the same way as the only way we'll govern artificial intelligence, which is getting close to human intelligence very quickly, will be to use artificial intelligence to regulate AI. We, we, we received the question from Masiek, and maybe it's the time to ask it before we go further into uh, into the, the narrative, let's say, about our future. Um, this question is, um, what do you think about other regulators getting into the cryptocurrency world? It feels like trying to make it just another controlled standard financial area. And that, that's a related question to that from Danielle about any comments about the Commission's regulation of markets and crypto assets micro proposals. Uh, if I'm honest, I haven't looked at those proposals. I, I, I'm spending a huge amount of my time understanding the innovations that are happening and, and, and then explaining them to my client base around the world. But I will have a look at them. In terms of regulation, it's very difficult, but we we tried in the past to create regulatory frameworks around central structures, central bank, centralized banking systems. And we've demonstrated that you know, our score is about four out of 10 in doing that. We have financial crashes. We look at what's going on now in the markets. And some would say it's a worse and more risky state than it was in 2008. So we, don't, we haven't done a brilliant job at regulation of what we have. When you move to decentralized structures, and the kind of rate at which these things develop, it's much harder to regulate with the old centralized mindset. You have to engage with the people who are creating this to say, okay, what are you doing? Explain that to me 92 times until I understand it. And then work with me, with me to say, how do we re regulate? And why are we trying to regulate? Well, we're trying to protect people from having their assets stolen. We're trying to make sure that what you're doing isn't illegal. And we're trying to make sure that we get the taxation revenue to do everything we need to do as countries to support our citizenry. So you need to be very clear on why you want to regulate. And then you engage the people who are creating in order to do that regulation. Because there's no other way. There's, there's no one other way of tracking what's going on, really understanding it with millions of people now in there. Less than 2% of the planet own crypto assets, but it's growing very fast. Uh, the data I have for the UK is that of people aged under 25, more have crypto assets than have pensions. 
So we have to understand that this is important. And that world is moving at a, a pace that's beyond exponential. Let me give you one example. There's a company been launched in the crypto space on the 14th of March called SafeMove. Today, the valuation of that company is $2.5 billion. How do you regulate something that's moving that fast? Yeah. It's probably got to $2.5 billion before you've even called the first meeting to discuss it. Yeah. And so we have to work with the people who are creating this innovation to say, how do you do this? And maybe we do some innovative things like saying to them, a proportion of your assets now, a proportion of whatever you raise in finance has to be set aside into a, a kind of regulatory incubator where we put bright minds to work with the ventures to experiment with what the right solutions are. But in effect, you fund it. Uh, and so we need really interesting and innovative ways of funding innovation. We're about the same stage in the crypto economy now as we were with the internet in about 1985, when no one thought the global economy would run on it. It makes, me, it makes me think of a fantastic video that Obi probably will share with us later. Yes, yeah, so I'll share that. I'll share that after the break, I think. But uh, um, that's a short interview with uh, Bill Gates, who was trying to explain uh, the uh, the internet back then. Um, but um, what right, uh, right to hear about volatility? Can we address that? Yes. Yeah, yes, yeah, sure. Maybe. Okay. So. Volatility is a really interesting thing. You need a level of volatility for markets to work. Uh, the volatility that we're seeing in crypto markets is an entire manipulation. And if you go in and you can, if you look at the people who've been studying this, you can see it's a very planned thing where a very small number of people bought very large amounts of crypto between one week and one month before the crash, the latest kind of drop in prices. They then sold that to drive the prices down, and they're all buying back in again now to buy, drive the prices up. It's, it's a very clear manipulation that's going on, but they've created a lot of volatility. Uh, but what we, have to, what we have to stand back and look at is the volatility that exists in other markets. If you look at what happened when Biden announced the $6 trillion next stage budget, we wiped off the US stock market more than the entire value of the crypto economy. I think we wiped off about $3 trillion in one day. So that volatility is there all the time. If you look at derivatives contracts, these complex financial instruments that contributed to the great financial crash, they are worth $1 quadrillion. Where should we be more worried? The volatility Im embedded in things that we can't even see or the volatility in a market that's less than $2 trillion today. Uh, and so we, we just have to stand back and, and understand it more and understand where the volatility comes from and, and the level of risk in these different markets and understand that volatility is, in a sense, the fuel for the global economy. So thanks to Ando for asking that question in the chat as well. We've been talking about cryptocurrencies uh, up until now, but uh, as you said, only 2% of people have that. There's perhaps a wider issue that's happened um, in the context of the pandemic, which is that many uh, businesses closed down, many people um, were um, uh, put out of uh, their jobs or furloughed, and um, even the Financial Times started talking about universal basic income, which has traditionally been seen as being a rather more left-wing idea. Um, wouldn't um, maybe we can talk a little bit about uh, about that? Where, what do you see as the perspective for for um, for for universal basic income or guaranteed basic income? I mean, what, what's the difference? Well. Interesting enough, one of the biggest proponents of a universal basic income was Ronald Reagan. And it was in his policy manifesto until the very last minute when he took office. Um, so, you know, we stand back. At, what we're seeing is two, two schools of thought. One is a universal basic income where you give every citizen a certain amount of money every year. And the US has ju just done this twice now, where it's given every citizen a check for. $1,900 or something. The argument against that is, 
why would you give someone earning 100,000 euros a year or even 50,000 euros a year, why would you give them free money? They don't need it. Uh, and so that moves to this idea of a guaranteed basic income that says we take everyone in society to a certain level of income. So if they're not working, we do that. That is more likely to gain traction than the giving everyone money. Um, and the view is that we need to help people transition through difficult times. Right now, the number one priority for the long term is to reskill society, is to have people learn how to learn again, learn new skills to acquire new jobs, and learn the meta skills that will allow them to move from job to job, like problem solving, big picture thinking, collaboration, communication, all those things. If we don't invest in those, then we're, re we're really creating big problems for the future. But there's a transition. If I lose my job today as a banker because the banks are cutting headcount, well, where am I going to go next? I might have to retrain to be a chemist in a, in a synthetic biology company because that's where the job growth is or to, be, you know, to work in a, a, an autonomous vehicle organization. So I need to retrain. So we need to fund you through that retraining period. And that's where guaranteed basic incomes come in. But we need to support people on that transition. And so for me, the much more interesting proposition is guaranteed basic incomes. Unfortunately, there's a kind of deep philosophical commitment amongst the universal basic income community that says they don't want that. They just want, they don't want any kind of means testing. They want everyone to get the same amount. I don't think they'll win. There's discussions in most countries in Europe. Ireland hopes that the new government in Ireland hopes to have a basic income pilot by 2025. 17 councils in the UK and Wales are, are asking governments to let them do uh, pilots. We've seen ex experiments in Finland, we've seen experiments in Germany, in Liberia, in Canada. So we're seeing more and more of them around the world. We're at a very, very early stage where we're still doing our learning, but it feels inevitable we'll do that. During the pandemic, many countries put a form of guaranteed basic income in place. Again, from the UK, we had more than 9 million people on what was called furlough, but that basically guaranteed them 80% of their income, their salary, up to a cap of 30,000 pounds. So that was a guaranteed income. So we've done it, we've experimented it with it. We need to do more experiments. We need to get up, set up the mechanisms to distribute the payments uh, easily. We probably need to include a, a, an element of guaranteed basic services. So transport, electricity, healthcare, a variety of things that are part of that package so that we don't have the friction losses of you getting the money, you paying someone, money being taken out of the system all the time. We need an efficient mechanism. So guaranteed basic services might form a chunk of it. Uh, but it, it seems like an essential mechanism as we have these big dislocations, as technology advancements take out jobs and we create new jobs in new industries, but we have to support people in that transition. Uh, Rui, can you just make a quick link to the Green Deal here and, and why this could be a good instrument to make sure we, we, we get to this uh, Green Deal? Well, if you, if you buy into the notion that we have to have a more sustainable future where we have zero emissions, zero waste, and zero grid-based energy generation, that we're all doing it at the point of consumption, then we need a lot of innovative solutions to get there. Solar power, all sorts of different renewables, new mechanisms to turn waste to power, uh, mechanisms to take emissions, at the, 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 the impact of emissions out of the atmosphere or store it to deflect the sun's rays. There's a whole range of technologies there greening the vehicles, greening production processes, et cetera. They're gonna require hundreds of thousands, if not millions of jobs, but we need to retrain people to do those jobs. And so that's one of the big areas that we'll retrain for, but they need to feed themselves while they're on that transition. And that's where a guaranteed basic income could come tied to you retraining for new jobs. So there's a comment there in the chat from Elva who's saying that there are already safety nets like active labour market policies that would help you to retrain when you lose a job. 
Um, but uh, from what you're saying, perhaps that's not enough if there's going to be massive transition um, uh, uh, of lots of people losing jobs in a particular particular in industry. Is that the idea? Or? It, it varies phenomenally from country to country. So if you look at the Scandic countries, they have better mechanisms for that and, and a better, I think a better level of protection. You'll find other countries in the wider Europe, not just within the European Union, that have less protections. And as you look further around the world, you know, there's a different level of protection. So we need to make sure that when people are retraining and reskilling, they don't have to move back to a subsistence level of existence, that they can maintain a reasonable lifestyle, that they they can have some element of a social life for their mental well-being. They're not constantly under stress, which is why people are talking about a relatively uh, high bar for what guaranteed basic income might look like, which is around average incomes in a lot of countries or something like average incomes or four fifths of average incomes, rather than the kind of the basic that many people might get on through the national welfare schemes. There are some corporations that come through and say that the highest paid person in the organization won't earn more than say four or five times the least paid. So you've got a variety of models. The owners of capital aren't very keen on that. The, the people who founded companies aren't very keen on that. Uh, there's a variety of views. Some shareholder advocate organizations are quite in favor. I think you need to do experiments. I think you need to understand what the second, third, fourth order effects are of doing this. Does it lead to companies moving to jurisdictions where they don't have that? Or moving their headquarters there? Does it lead to people being paid offshore? Does it lead to uh, people being paid in, in cryptocurrencies and things? That, what, what are the impacts of that? And maybe you kind of, you, you take a, a relatively small country like Iceland and you say, you know what, we're, we collectively as, as the European Union will put up the costs of you putting in place the infrastructure to do this. Uh, and you be our experimental test bed. And we see what happens to you over a two to five year period of doing this. And, and we'll work out you know, what the issues are. We'll do that learning and then we'll bring it back into our own countries. I think you've got huge political uh, challenges. I, I don't think it's a, wo a vote winning proposal in most countries, even in so-called socialist regimes uh, communist regimes, I can't see this being popular. And so it's going to take some delicate navigation. It's going to take some very strong leadership. And it's going to take some powerful evidential base that says, actually, if you do this, here's what happens to society. Here's what's happened, what happens to people's well-being. Here's what happens to the quality of life. Here's what happens to mental health. Here's what happens to crime blah, 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 and, and the, the stability of the economy. But you need the evidence uh, to, to drive this one through because there are very powerful forces that will be lined up against it. I think some of the, the unintended consequences will be that you could see very small countries with relaxed wars becoming some of the biggest economies in the world because wealthy people move themselves and their business headquarters to those countries. I have a question coming back to this community. Uh, you mentioned of, uh, you know, enthusiastic people about the future. It seems to be very value-based. And, and we had different discussions actually in Together Ensemble about our values. Um, I wonder, can you underline what these values are? You mentioned transparency, you mentioned, I, I felt fairness and innovation and citizen focus. Are there other values that you can share with us? Yeah, I, I think it's very easy when you when I have a short conversation to sort of take away the idea that the crypto economy was set up by Buddhist monks, you know, who are thinking seven generations ahead. That's not the case. People came up with some democratic ideals. They wanted these things. Obviously, people have gone in there and seen that there's huge amounts of money to be made. There are scammers in there. There's all sorts of things going on. So not everyone is driven by altruistic goals. But certain values that I think are common across that community are that we can do things in a distributed manner that, that takes away the control of central organizations. 
uh, that we can have a trustless model, i.e. it's totally transparent because everything is recorded in multiple places uh, in distribute, you know, it's like having accounting ledger, but replicated multiple times. You don't know who the people are, but you can see who, you know, they can see their digital identity. So you can see everything that's going on. Uh, this ability to fractionalize everything. So today, if I want to buy a share in Siemens, I have to have, I don't know what the, the current price is, but let's say 200 euros. If I buy a crypto asset, I can buy it down to one eighteenth of one cent. <laughs> I can pay, I can, I can invest that little. So it's really democratizing the access to finance. And that democratized access was very important. Uh, the next was about scalability, that you could come up with innovative ideas and you could scale them very quickly. You could grow them very fast, which is why SafeMoon grew so quickly. And the final was about this idea of the power of the network, that the network made things happen very quickly. You can spread ideas like a virus, but you also bring the network in to do governance. So you actually prevent bad behavior and, and that requirement for governance means that the the creators of these ventures have nowhere to, to hide they have to come and talk to their community on a regular basis they have to answer tough questions they have to explain their roadmap they have to explain their reasoning their rewards are totally transparent when they publish the white paper for the launch of their business so it's just a a very different set of models from the start about what organizations look like and and if, if you like those are those become the values as well mm -hmm. it seems to be uh, increasing the, the well-being of people in the network it, it, it's it should do it should do a feeling, a feeling. If, if we sort of said actually uh companies could pay their employees a proportion in a cryptocurrency that might give an awful lot of people to have a financial future that would otherwise be denied to them yeah because that asset could grow in time. Mm -hmm. and, and if you look uh, through history, the, fast, uh, the, the, the asset that has grown most in value is Bitcoin. Others might do the same in the future, but if you put a uh, thousand euros into Bitcoin on the day it launched, it would be worth around $200 million at its peak this year, about a month ago. Now it would be about 180 million euros. That's crazy. Yeah. Nothing else has done that in a 10 year period. So. <laughs> That's a that that gives the opportunity for any citizen to break out of a pattern that means they they're living just on their income and they can never you know break out of that and they they're kind of more and more marginalised over time because automation reduces the number of jobs available or the, or the the pay rates for the jobs that are available. We need to find innovative mechanisms for everyone to be a fully participating member of society. It seems to be very important to, uh, to, to show accountability in such a uh, context, let's say. So everyone gets accountability, everyone gets transparency, everyone gets ethics, and being a broadly ethical uh, based company, more and more people are getting sustainability. The question is how you embed that in the operating model for organizations, for governments, for nations. And that's where it gets complicated because you have people who come up with really interesting theories about how you create this in complex and adaptive organizations like countries, like families, like nation, uh, like businesses. The challenge is how you get help people get their head around the complexity of the idea to deal with the complexity of the organization. And so many great theories come out the challenge is how we move them from the, 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 the people who are thinking about this and investing time to understand it to the general populace. Uh, when the general populace kind of operates in headlines. You know, I come in from a country where one number on the side of a, a bus changed the entire course of our history. 350 million pounds a week we would save for the NHS. Um, <laughs> you might debate, you know, any of that, but it was that simplistic, simplistic, and then it was get Brexit done. And so, when you're in a world where slogans have become 
the mechanism for public dialogue, how you get across these more complex ideas is quite a challenge. Mm. So one of our biggest challenges is how we learn to put across, across complex ideas in a way that people can consume. The past model was, don't worry, citizen, you sit down, you do the job you've got, you take the money we allow you to have, you have a vote once every five years or four years or whatever, and we'll deal with all the complicated stuff. And we'll pay lawyers to draft it and you know, accountants to work out how you engineer it and consultants to work out how you change it. But don't you worry, we'll sort it all out. But, but what's happened is it doesn't really seem to have had an impact on the front line for people, for healthcare workers, for teachers, for pupils, for all sorts of parts of society. So we need some very different models and we need ways of getting them into the public dialogue that people are willing to talk about it without getting too partisan too quickly, without getting too emotional too quickly, and without starting just from the, well, what's in it for me? So, so there's lots of great ideas, but, but we need new mechanisms for dialogue. We need new, new collective dialogue, collective intelligence mechanisms to explore these things. There's perhaps one topic we we didn't yet cover, or we didn't cover much so far, and I'm, we're, we're reaching uh, the end of our time on the uh, for this part. Uh, but maybe we could talk about the changing relations between employers, work, and employment models. What we've seen in the course of the pandemic is suddenly everybody realised that they could work remotely, and uh, you mentioned about companies moving their headquarters to where things, uh, where the manpower was cheaper, but do they really need to move in this context anymore? Can they be where they are and just hire people remotely in those, uh, in those countries? How, how would that work? So you have to separate where you put your headquarters and where your highest paid people are based from where your company can be based. And, and that, that's about taxation policy, that's about financial incentives for where you the place the, the, the place where you pay your taxes or the place where you, you manage your money. Uh, from the point of view of organizations, I think most organizations understand that at least some of what they do today they can automate more. And, and the pandemic showed that that tools that we wouldn't even have talked about a year ago we're suddenly doing. We're saving a huge amount of time by rather than going to a meeting in another country and taking out a day, two days, we can do it in one hour on a web platform. Uh, we're learning that actually we can automate a lot of our customer communications, our service with chatbots and things. So people are beginning to see this. And on the one hand, if you're an, an owner of a business, there's an attraction to increasing your productivity by getting higher yield automation and reducing your headcount. Uh, and as I said, there's a lot of organizations, particularly in the tech space, who think that sometime between 2022 and 2025, we'll reach peak employment in organizations relative to revenue, mm. that the proportion of people to revenue will change, that the earnings per employee or the revenue per employee will start to go up dramatically. And so, we're then starting to think about, well, what are the right models? And you've seen lots of legal challenges around the kind of gig economy model, Uber drivers, delivery drivers, or fast food delivery people, people coming to do all sorts of services where they're, they're on a strange kind of contract where they don't have the employment protections. One view is that regulation will force everyone to, to have more protection for the workforce. There's another view that says actually the relationship will become much looser. More and more people will be on contract. More and more people will be on very flexible working relationships with the people they get paid by uh, that will build up more and more of a portfolio career working with multiple organizations at any one time and multiple organizations over time. And that could lead to an explosion of those people as small businesses with, with all of that going on. I, th I think there's a, an imperative there again around learning. I won't go through that again, but learning is going to be critical to, to survive in that. But the, the question then becomes about legal responsibility for the employers. How much legal responsibility do they have around health and welfare, around working hours, 
around what they pay people. And we can see all that changing. And if, if we have uh, a, a positive economic outlook, the roaring 20s scenario where everything booms, then you can see a more paternalistic, if you like, uh, model, a more caring model. If we go more towards the kind of darker, prolonged recession, depression type model, then you can see it moving to a much less caring model. Uh, where people are left much more to their own devices. The organizations get very small, a very small core of people and really outsource as much as they can and only hire in when they absolutely need to. So there isn't one view. Technology is going to play a part. The economy is going to play a part. The overriding philosophy in society about the relative balance of people versus economics versus profit uh, versus engagement. It, it's going to play out differently in a lot of different countries. Thank you, Rohit, for a really very thought-provoking uh, conversation, um, which I'm sure all of us have uh, appreciated here.